You have been fed a constant lie and the truth has been slowly revealed. And that is that in spite of big tech promises that you control your privacy, the reality is that whatever you do, your locations are being tracked. This tracking is done primarily through your phone. One of the biggest trackers is Google and every data point is stored in what Google calls the sensor vault. What you have not realized is that this database of locations and phone identifiers, among other things, is made available to law enforcement via a geofencing warrant. Geofencing is the ability to identify people found in a particular location marked by a GPS position at a particular time. The area covered by the geofence request can be specified by the requester. In some cases, it is a few city blocks. In other cases, it is a larger area like the area surrounding the Capitol building. It also includes a time range. We know of these requests because Google has been open about supporting geofencing warrants and it is documented in various court cases. Obviously, other players like Apple also has their own location database and their own ability to respond to geofencing warrants, though we have no public information on the extent of the provided information. Law enforcement also has tools to do geofencing within limited areas. And these, of course, are only the publicly known pieces of this. Google, of course, has unfettered access to this data and could very easily feed this information to its own AI called BARD. In this video, I'm just going to focus on how geofencing works, the risks of geofencing warrants to innocent people, and then I will let you in on some secrets about how to evade geofencing at the end. Stay right there. The main legal argument against geofencing is that doing a general dragnet of people who are not suspected of any crime is a violation of the U.S. Constitution's Fourth Amendment, which protects unreasonable search and seizure. Let me just give you a few examples of how geofencing warrants have been used. Zachary McCoy used an app called RunKeeper to track his bike rides in his neighborhood. As it happens, a burglary occurred during one of his bike rides and he was deemed a suspect. He got a notice from Google that he had seven days to go to court or Google will release his information to law enforcement. McCoy spent several thousand dollars to block Google from releasing his information. George Molina was not so lucky. He was wrongfully arrested for murder and was told only when interrogated that his phone, without a doubt, placed him at the crime scene. Despite Molina having an alibi, the police arrested him, locked him in jail for six days. As a result, Molina dropped out of school, lost his job, car, and reputation, and now has nightmares of his time in jail. You may remember the January 6th Capitol riots. The FBI obtained a geofencing warrant and asked Google to identify all phones in the area of the Capitol around the time of the riots. One of those defendants, whose name is Ryan, argued to the court that the geofencing warrant was overly broad and thus violated the Fourth Amendment. This March, the U.S. District Court in D.C. determined that the warrant was valid. As of March, 948 people have been charged based on this information. In another geofencing case in California, the case People v. Meza, the California Court of Appeals ruled that the warrants, as requested by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, was unconstitutional because it did in fact violate the Fourth Amendment. Apparently, the Sheriff's Department requested phones tracked at multiple locations in multiple city block sizes of area, and many thousands of people were included in the data in this court case. They did spot the suspect, and in spite of the unconstitutionality ruling, the evidence was still considered valid against Meza. In Virginia, a geofence warrant was requested to solve the crime of a bank robbery, and a suspect was eventually found and charged based on this information. The defendant, Chatry, filed a case stating that the warrant violated the Fourth Amendment. The U.S. District Court also ruled that this blatantly broad warrant was unconstitutional. 
but again, the evidence was sustained as valid. Based on legal filings from Google, we know now that Geofence requests jumped 1,500% from 2017 to 2018, and another 500% from 2018 to 2019. And now Google reports that Geofence warrants make up 25% of all the warrants Google receives in the U.S. Although a few of these warrants have been litigated as being unconstitutional, nothing really has changed. And the fact is that law enforcement will continue to do dragnets to include large numbers of innocent people in the solving of crimes. This is the equivalent of doing a full body search on everyone in a location because one person is suspected of being a thief. For privacy-minded people like me, I just have a single goal. Leave me alone. If I didn't commit a crime and I'm not suspected of committing a crime, then you have no right to my data. Unfortunately, when it comes to digital data, specifically location data, this is now pretty uncontrolled. Now let me talk about how geofencing can actually be done in a broad way. I won't get into heavy details though. I have a video on location tracking that gets into absolutely heavy details on this. Location data can be acquired from your phone in four ways. These are the four ways. Number one, cell tower triangulation, which is the carrier database. Number two, SUPL, which is a cell tower based triangulation used by Google for GPS. Number three, MZ catcher or Stingray, which is a portable device used by law enforcement. Number four, Google's and Apple's NLP tracking which is the location technology built into your phone. The first one, cell tower. You can pretty much assume that your phone carrier knows precisely which tower you are connected to when your phone is detected. In fact, your phone checks in with a tower on a regular basis even when you are not doing anything. So this means that the carrier knows your approximate location. It will be some area around the closest tower. In a big city, this can be a small area like one half mile all around the tower. And using the signal strength of other towers, your general quadrant can be determined. In the future, 6G or millimeter wave capability on cell data will allow location tracking within inches using a technology called beamforming. Number two, supple. The next method of tracking is available to Google. You will find that Google really has several ways of collecting location information. The way which I call supple is a GPS feature on all phones, pretty much. This technology allows the phone to search for the nearest cell tower so that the supple provider can compute which GPS satellite is closest. Now, in case you're wondering what this has to do with Google, well, Google bought the patent for Supple. So all requests for Supple in the world goes to supple.google.com. This means a gross location of every phone in the world, regardless of maker or OS, if it has a GPS, will be known to Google. And of course, they all have a GPS. However, this may be incomplete data since Google will not have some other identifier to match the location to an individual. So this depends. This is not 100%. Number three, MZ catcher or stingray. This method of geofencing requires physical presence. Basically, one of the capabilities of an MZ catcher device is that it can detect the presence of any MZ in the immediate area. The MZ is the identifier transmitted by every phone in order to connect to cell service. Law enforcement has many of these devices and they are portable. The original common model was called Stingray and the newer ones use other sea creature names, all made by the Harris Corporation. A Stingray device can be located in a vehicle, can be carried by a person, and can be mounted on a drone or airplane. Given a GPS position of the Stingray type device, then any detected MZ would be positively identified 
as being in any particular area. For example, it is a certainty that in the Capitol January 6th event, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies would have been using these devices to spot the phones in the area. This, of course, would seriously identify a person as being in that specific location. Number four, Google and Apple NLP tracking. NLP means Network Location Provider. All phones are set to connect to a network location provider to acquire location information. Specifically, the phone will sense the environment for a GPS position and also Wi-Fi routers in the area. Then using a technique called Wi-Fi triangulation, the device will be identified to be within a certain area. This is quite accurate, typically giving a location ping within six feet. This works even indoors because the computation of the location is based on external data like Wi-Fi routers in the area and signal strength. This data then is fed to the NLP provider, Apple or Google. Thus, naturally, Apple and Google gets the location information first. Now, this information may or may not be shared to a third party depending on permissions. However, understand that Apple and Google always know where you are because of their NLP service, among other things. There are actually other location determining services on phones like Wi-Fi scanning, Apple's mesh network, which supports AirTags to name a couple more. There are also proximity trackers like the use of Bluetooth in contact tracing. But the details don't matter. What's important to note here is that if you have a standard phone, then all four of these techniques for tracking you are always in effect. Now we know, because of these court cases, that Google aggregates the sensor information in a single database called the Sensor Vault. So whether you like it or not, you are in the Sensor Vault. This is likely matched to your Google ID when they can, together with other identifiers like the IMSI, IMAI, and IP address. Each sensor location reading is clearly identified by a timestamp as well, so that's how someone can track your movements over time. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm truly uncomfortable knowing that several third parties, and in particular Apple and Google, notes every place I've been, ever. And this is not even connected to any warrant. The reason I'm able to explain this to you is because we know there are warrants and this information is part of the court cases I mentioned. The more significant problem is not just the danger of unconstitutional use of location information to do a drag den on innocent people, but the fact that a permanent record exists of everyone's movements in this world and controlled by a few players, Google and Apple. And now this has nothing to do with warrants. It's just somebody with this data. This data can later be fed into an AI like BARD, and maybe it already has been fed to the AI. The AI can analyze behaviors, habits, and there's measures of social strata and job function just from location. Even religion can be determined from location and even politics. Google and Apple can know everyone you connect to just from looking at intersections of locations. And now it is very dangerous to even do a peaceful protest somewhere because you will be flagged somehow in these databases and an AI can draw some conclusion from that data. Can we get out of this morass? Is there a way out? Well, specifically against Google and Apple, yes, there is a way out. There is less of a way out with the other methods of location geofencing, but they are not as accurate, so those methods are less of a threat. Well, the best tool to pretty much eliminate big tech geofencing data is to use a de-Google phones. Phones like the Brax2, Google Pixels with some de-Googled OS like Calyx OS or Lineage OS, Linux phones like the Pine phone and Librem 5 and some others in this realm would absolutely not provide geofencing data to Google. Let me give a specific example. A Brax2 phone running Brax OS does not have an NLP or network location provider. In fact, by default, Brax2 phones do not provide location information indoors. They only use GPS outdoors. Also, the Google phones in general have no Google ID. So no specific identifier is passed to Google if you're not logged in. 
and the Google phones have no Google system apps that have permission to snag your IMSI IMEI or phone number. In other words, a D Google phone is invisible to Google. Obviously, it is also invisible to Apple since it is not an Apple device. The next level of tracking I want to disengage is the supple feature built into every phone. In our Brax2 phones, we attempt to redirect this request to a different domain, which can remove the phone identifiers in the process. Unfortunately, we do not know all of the interactions of Supple, so we can't 100% be certain we're covering all instances of this location data leak. However, as I explained earlier, Supple is only a cell tower triangulation, so it is not an exact location. The only way to stop Supple tracking is to put the device in a Faraday bag or turn it off. MZ Catcher or Stingray is not a threat to normal people. To be honest, because of the Google geofencing warrants, the need for the MZ Catcher is less anyway. And law enforcement can read your text and see your phone call history directly by connecting to the carrier under a law called Kalia. The specific value of an MC catcher would be in a case like the Capitol riots where you do not know the people but would like to know who's in the area. This makes it a specific risk to those people who participate in public protests. In fact, it should be a fear in any country, especially those with non-democratic governments. I remember a photo of people wearing anonymous masks in Hong Kong as they protested the actions of the Hong Kong government done at the behest of China. And I see in the picture that people were milling around in the protests, mostly young people, with their mobile phones in their hands, so those people are clearly zucked. The protection from this is simple. In order for an IMZ catcher to work, your phone must emit an IMZ, and that particular value is in the SIM card. So, if you remove the SIM card, there is no IMZ. On some phones, like Abrax 2, you can disable the SIM card in the operating system itself without removing it. Makes it easier to turn it on and off at will. Some will argue about this and talk about 911 emergency calling features on the phone. I will not get into explaining the details here, but trust me, no SIM equals no MZ, thus you are not tracked. Which of course correlates to the carrier data. The carrier knows approximately where you are today in order to pick a tower. And when your tower is constantly changing, it marks out your path. However, the same rule applies. No SIM card means no carrier tracking. Carrier tracking is approximate, like I said. But still, if you're driving, for example, the constant change in towers will reveal where you are going. This is not as significant of a threat because it is not precise. I can't say you entered a particular building or was next to another person. However, in the next iteration of cell technology, which they might call 6G, the carriers will have the same location tracking data as big tech. So watch out for this as a future threat. So there you go, a full explanation of geofencing and a clear way of evading it. Don't be overexcited with tracker devices like AirTags or fitness watches. Remember that these devices just feed the Google Sensor Vault and whatever Apple calls its equivalent database. Folks, I have privacy products that protect your data so it will not be exposed to any rogue app. We have a Brax2 privacy phone running an open source Brax OS that makes your phone invisible. We also do flashing services to the Google other phone models on our store, as well as stocking pre-flashed pixels. We have a VPN service, Bytes VPN, which has features like Tor routing, DNS obfuscation, and ad blocking. We have Braxmail, which is a metadata free way of doing email where no one knows where the message originated from. These products are on my app, Braxme. Come visit us there. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.